Hi, welcome to Getting High on Anthropology. This is Marty Otanez. Tonight we have a guest, Carlos Jimenez, a professor at the University of Denver. Welcome to the show. The show deals with cannabis defined broadly. Mm. You have no connection to cannabis, but the reason you're here, the reason you're a guest on the show, is because you have this interesting approach to doing scholarship. So you use visual methodologies. So what I want to do first is have you talk a bit about where you work and your position, and then we'll go into some of the projects that you're working on. Yeah, sounds good. So my name is Carlos Jimenez, and I'm at the University of Denver, uh, and I teach in the Media, Film, and Journalism Studies Department. And within that department, uh, my, my workload is mostly focused on film studies and also uh, actually doing some of the new media work, right? Um, now, in terms of the actual uh, methodologies, I, it actually just starts, I guess, from a passion of wanting to learn how to take pictures and learn how moving images worked, right? When I was young, I had a little JVC camcorder, attached it to duct tape and all sorts of poles and things. Um, but now, that's actually the way in which I, I integrate myself into a community. So I was working most recently in California with farm workers and as a way to try to build their trust or get to know who they were, I had a D7000 Nikon camera, uh, had some strobes, a uh, light kit, right, to take pictures, and I went to the fields and would ask the farm workers, hey, uh, I'm happy to take a family portrait for you in exchange for an interview. So it's actually just one of the ways in which I built a, a sense of familiarity with them um, and got to do what I loved, and at the end of the day was able to study this community, um, become part of it, learn about places and people. So before we talk about some of the work you did previously, um, share a bit about the kinds of classes you're teaching, and then um, uh, in general, what is it like being at DU? You're new to Denver, DU is a new institution for you, so just, I'm yeah. just curious about your thoughts about DU and your, your job. Yeah, so uh, like I said, I, I do mostly the film study side. As of right now, I've been there two quarters, so I will speak to those two quarters. Um, uh, I've gotten to teach the intro to, to film, so we basically take students, we require, it's one of the requirements, uh, it meets one of the requirements for the university, and so the students uh, from all sorts of majors, biology, business, have to take this intro to film course, if they decide, right, there's a bunch of choices. Um, but we watch a bunch of films, which is always wonderful, but we mostly talk about it in terms of a form, right? So. We give them the language to understand the types of cuts, the types of lighting, how that's all used to as a form of expression. You know, every week is broken down by, for example, sound, genre, um, cinematography. So we basically talk about the language. That's the intro course, and then as the students progress, they get to take courses like uh, the most recent one I taught was intro, no, not intro, Latin American fil film. So basically, it was a history class exploring everything from the origins of Latin American cinema to some of its current manifestations. Um, and then the other course that I've taught is the intro to media and culture. And so, in, and that's sort of the, the more media broadly, exploring it more broadly, right? So, um, that's basically where I shock the students into uh, <laughs> recognizing uh, there's a week called surveillance. Mm. And it's probably the most shocking week for a lot of the students. I, I make them actually read the privacy policies of Snapchat, Uber, Lyft, Facebook, and they're actually quite surprised uh, about what is being collected about them, how much power, how much uh, information they're giving to these institutions, these media Scary. companies. And I would love in the future to talk about like a cannabis film studies course, because even oh, yeah. how cannabis or any product or any uh, uh, economy is represented in film and then of course dissect it in all these different ways. So again, one of the reasons you're here, you have this methodology, this approach of using visual media for research purposes, community building purposes. So let's go back in time a bit. In Southern California, you had this experience with radio. Yeah, so yeah. tell us about radio, what you did, and maybe one of like your favorite um, accomplishments um, down in Southern California? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it, I think, is just luck. Um, I was driving there with an anthropologist, Juan Vicente Palerm, and we were there basically to learn about farm worker communities. 
And I said, well, you know, I'm interested in that and I want to learn anthropology and this guy's willing to teach me and he's kind of cool and he likes me, so let me go. Um, and I ended up in Oxnard, California, which is uh, one of the many strawberry capitals. And I quickly decided that that's where I wanted to do my dissertation. Didn't know what it was going to be on, didn't know what I was going to do, had no sense of, had no threads connecting any of the, the things I was about to do, except that it would be on farm workers. Um, and so quickly I started to find all the nonprofits. And one of those nonprofits was the Mixteco, the, what is it, MICUP, Mixteco Indigena Community Organizing Project. And this organization is dedicated to empowering and supporting and helping the indigenous population within the county. And I just started volunteering. I just showed up <laughs> a couple days out of the week and said, hey, I live down the block. I'm, I'm happy to do whatever you need me to do. Um, and surprisingly, they had already started working on this radio station and knowing that I was a media studies guide, no one told me that they were doing, they were building a radio station. So it was uh, a great fit. It, it was, but nobody told me, um, except until I, because I was there, right? This is a key co uh, component of ethnography is you just gotta be there. You just gotta watch and observe and learn and see and witness. And I overheard these conversations about a radio station and so I, I butted in, as a good anthropologist or <laughs> ethnographer would do. And one of the farm workers told me that there was a meeting that night you, and I should come. And after that, I just started coming, start, just started showing up uh, to the, month, the weekly meetings that they had. And before I knew it, being one of the few people that was college educated, that was bilingual, that I spoke Spanish and English, they ended up hiring me as the first um, radio director to build the radio station. And at that point, they had only submitted um, an application to the FCC or a low power FM radio station. A lot of the successful strategies that we used were defined by the audience. So obviously you have to most importantly consider who the audience is and what they're used to watching and consuming. So for us, it was obviously a farm work community. And more than that, it was an indigenous community, right? So these weren't just your typical Mexicans. These were indigenous Mexicans who had recently arrived maybe five, ten years or so, and they primarily speak Mixteco or Zapoteco, not Spanish or English, so we knew that. Uh, on top of that, we also knew that most of them consumed content on their mobile phone. And so naturally, we decided out of, resor uh, out of available resources for us, we had mobile phones, we had Facebook, we had social media. That was sort of how we started to define our, our target audience. And so what we realized that was, wasn't going to work very well, it wasn't going to be as powerful, um, was these polished high-def videos. Instead, what was actually going to be more powerful were these selfie shot, handheld phones of somebody speaking into the camera in their indigenous language, or somebody else filming somebody on a mobile phone or live streaming. And not Th necessarily pre-scripted. Not pre-scripted speaking from the heart, speaking varying from indigenous language to Spanish, and short. That was key. The first time we made this five, six minute video posted on YouTube, and YouTube is really nice because it tells you when people start to drop out. It actually has a really nice set of data. And we recognize that by the third minute <laughs> of this six minute video, <laughs> yeah, people started to drop out. So for us, it was actually this lo-fi style that resonated most with the audience members, and it fit the genre of these other sites that the farm workers were going to. There's, as immigrants, there was a lot of nostalgia media, a lot of websites like um, saying like, hey, this is my region, and they would post these very intimate, very lo-fi videos, and so naturally, that's the, the, the strategy that we tried to tap into, and it helped because we didn't necessarily have all of the resources, but that was one of the biggest ways that, that we started to, to use a visual strategy was just adopting this lo-fi, and I actually think that it's probably one of the more successful models that is underused by a lot of organizations. So speaking to, to the cannabis workers themselves, I would say that they don't have to necessarily shoot for these high def, beautifully cut, beautifully created videos. I find, and as a consumer myself, I find that building a relationship or having a person that is personable, that can communicate, speaking into a camera lo-fi and showing what they're doing, something extraordinarily simple, but also done on a regular 
basis can actually be a really compelling form of, of media production for, for companies and organizations. You're in Denver. You've been here since July of 2017. Mm -hmm. You've done some projects with El Centro. Yeah, so tell yeah. me about that <coughs> briefly and then talk about uh, one of the videos or a couple of videos and we'll integrate them into the show. Yeah, so again, it's just this methodology that I've developed. I, I show up in a community that I, one, can identify with, two, maybe from my perspective, could use something from me, can use, I can bring some sort of knowledge to them to support them. And so when I arrived to, to Denver, naturally there's not very many farm workers within the metropolitan area, so that wasn't necessarily something I could do, but there were day laborers, right? Um, so I found out about uh, Centro Humanitario and I just started to show up. Uh, and I started to get to know the workers. I bring my microphone, I record conversations with them. And the one thing I noticed about them is that one, they want to work. And two, when winter hits, when it gets cold, there's almost no work available for them. And so I tried to figure out with the executive director and with the workers themselves, a, a way to use short videos to promote what they were doing, right? To humanize them. Most of their, their website is, and, and social media is filled with pictures. They do have one video, um, and uh, maybe a couple more, but they're very general. They speak about the organization. They don't really speak about the workers in, in a lot of detail. So I thought something that would build on what I had been doing already was to take a camera and have them to speak into the camera and just actually just speak about the idea of work, right? What does it mean to work? who taught you how to work, right? And that was a way in which I was able to continue to hammer away at a theme. But they also reveal these beautiful stories. A lot of them, naturally, when somebody asks about work, most of us will speak about our parents. And so a lot of them talked about these moments where they learned about the value of work. And so there's actually one video um, where I, I think is one of the best responses where you know the day laborer is actually speaking about what his, his parents told him about committing to do a job, you know, and what that means to him. And ultimately, I think that it's at these strategies, these, these video strategies, these interview methods, and these short, short videos can really pull a lot of humanity out of the people. And for this organization, um, put that out into the, into the real world and get people to consider these as reliable workers. And so uh, I have a couple of videos and I'm sure we'll <laughs> broadcast them. Mi nombre es Carla Valentín, tengo 27 años de edad y soy parte del equipo del Centro Humanitario de Daily Labor. Soy la única mujer en el equipo. Un day labor es um, un trabajo por día, te pagan a diario. Yo pienso que los discriminan porque piensan que las personas no tienen un trabajo estable. Pues les quisiera decir que no los discriminen, que aunque somos latinos, somos muy trabajadores. Mi mamá, desde que yo tengo uso de razón, mi mamá me enseñó a trabajar. Este, ella siempre doblaba turno de noche para mantenerme a mí y a mi familia. Trabajo porque tengo unos valores que me enseñaron que el dinero hay que ganarlo trabajando con el sudor de la frente, no robando ni aceptando ayuda de gobierno. El trabajo que me encanta hacer es de limpieza limpieza en hoteles o en cuartos o casas. Pues la razón por la que trabajo es porque tengo dos niños pequeños y estoy sola aquí en los Estados Unidos. Quiero um, trabajar para comprarle juguetes a mi niño. Queremos trabajar porque al igual que, que todas las personas aquí en los Estados Unidos, que ellos tienen, tienen identidad, nosotros también necesitamos sostener nuestra familia y necesitamos una paga honrable para nosotros. I was always told by my parents or my dad that uh, when somebody takes on a job that it's a commitment between you and that person, it's a commitment between you and that work, and that once you commit yourself to work you should finish off the work and you shouldn't uh, quit halfway and you should know what you're getting yourself into when you decide to go to work. My name is James Henderson, I'm 47 and I'm a day laborer. 
I think that uh, a lot of people who um, see day laborers, uh, they tend to be people who maybe cannot uh, hold a job regularly or um, maybe they're unscrupulous, um, you know, they can't, they're not trustworthy. Um, but uh, I think uh, day laborers are um, people who are uh, looking to uh, get a chance to better themselves and to uh, make a better life for themselves and to prove to uh, workers and uh, employees and employers that they can, uh, you know, be reliable and show up on time. <clears throat> I want to work because <clears throat> I need to uh, pay bills and I need to support my family and um, I need to uh, feel better about myself and um, it's important that um, every man, woman uh, feels more human to work because when you're working then society as a whole um, tends to uh, have a better positive outlook towards that person. Roberto, de 72 años. Como hay de muchos, uh, como por ejemplo ayer que fuimos, fuimos a la remolición, a veces es jardín, a veces poner piedras, poner moches, hay de muchos trabajos. ¿Qué quieres trabajar? No, pues para pa, pa juntar algo para cuando ya me haga más viejo que ya no pueda trabajar. Que son, son sentado para pa estar comiendo y viviendo bien, nomás. Sí, pues casi todo me gusta. No hay trabajo que no me guste, sí, porque peor si me dan buen billete porque hay personas que sí me pagan bien. El trabajo a mí no me hace media todavía, está, está no me canso que diga, ay, cómo me duele. Me levanto como si no hubiera trabajado otro día, como ayer que trabajamos. Trabajamos tumbando paredes y echando, cargando la basura en botas a, a una carreta y no van a decir re bien. Queremos trabajar porque tenemos familia. So how has the work you've been doing, the relationships, the conversation that, that you, you've had with people, how has it affected you? Have you been influenced in any way or have you changed in any way? Like if I saw you 10 years ago, like I'm just curious with some of the growth because I know with my work, uh, interfacing with workers in a different setting, you know, it, it does have an impact on you. So I'm just curious about your thoughts. I think I'm, I was really strategic about the type of communities that I wanted to be involved in, right? Uh, academia does things to you. It's um, an ivory tower of sorts, and if you decide you want to be an armchair academic, you can easily do that. It takes your uh, soul. It, it can <laughs> take your soul, and I uh, have chosen this route only if I could give back, right? Uh, I decided even to go to college because I wanted to go back to my neighborhood on the south side of Chicago and start a media center. That was my initial goal, was to immediately take everything I could learn and go back to my community. I have this desire to just be with my community. To I see education as a way to come and take those resources and go back to the community. And so that's obviously what I'm doing with the research methodology. But when I choose these particular communities, these are worker communities, they help remind me of the real problems in my life. Um, that, and they, you know, just by comparison, it's not something that I do purposefully. I, you know, I recognize how lucky I am, uh, how lucky I am to sit in, you know, on a Thursday, to sit in my house in my pajamas and read and write and think. Um, and so that for me, just to be around these community members and to recognize what is really important, um, which is being supportive of each other, being in a community, uh, working, supporting family, life, love, like these are real issues that you know, just being with them reminds me. And so when I'm back in an academic space or you know, I'm, I'm in a university, which tends to, to have a lot of you know, privileged youth, right? You know, any university has that. Um, to be with workers who are thinking about, well, what am I gonna eat tomorrow? Where am I gonna get my money from? Uh, I don't know, I mean, it, it reminds me of my parents and what they grew up with. So it's things that I don't wanna forget about. It's things that I wanna make sure that I'm constantly working to to, to resolve and to support 
That's um, great. Yeah, so. it's very humbling, and it's also like a source of strength and power yeah. Yeah. to be driven to you know see some change that's either measurable or just to be educated by other people who live <sighs> these struggles every day, yeah. and not just to be an observer, but just collaborate with folks. The amount so, that you learn from a farm worker that makes one fifth of what you make, you know, is really incredible. I think. The one thing that the the most important thing I learned from farm workers is, uh, even when you don't have enough, find a way to give, and I think that's really inspirational. When I was in these spaces where we were trying to build this radio station, these farm workers gave, brought food, even when they probably didn't have enough to give, and it is it is inspirational. Excellent. So now take us to like one representative worker, one video. One that sort of stands out that maybe just, you know, left you thinking differently. So is there one that you can talk about? Yeah, yeah. His name is Roberto, and he is probably one of the oldest day laborers at, at the center. Um, but his strength, his desire um, is incredibly compelling and inspiring and just... You hope that when you are that age, and I can't remember the age that he, he, he says, but I hope that when I'm that age, I have that level of passion and fire and willingness to earn my way, you know? And then what was his video? Like he was instructed, given some tools, um, or at least skills, and he shot some video of himself working? Oh, so there's two types of videos. This one's an, an interview, right? Gotcha. So I'm just asking him questions to reflect on, on the idea of work. But yeah, in, in terms of the actual work, there's uh, a couple of other videos that we can show where um, there's a day laborer who's actually really proud of the painting job that he did and the amount of of you know carefulness of the trimming and all of that and so he actually shows the video and he whispers very carefully about his work i don't think we see his face but he was when he showed me this video he was really proud he kept telling me mia do you see that line <laughs> that was my line um yeah so what we'll do now is we'll take a break and we're going to run the video uh, let viewers get a chance to see it and then we'll be right back with carlos from uh, university of denver all right, welcome back. This is Marty Otanias with Getting High on Anthropology. Um, we're running out of time, but what tips, what two or three recommendations would you have for people, whether students or community members, that want to sort of do what you're doing in terms of, number one, having genuine relationships of trust with people, um, having a worker focus, and allowing workers themselves to take videos. Yeah. So what would be some of the, like, the technical things to think of, and then just other thoughts to do it well and do it with integrity? Yeah, I think um, one is obviously linguistic concerns, depending on the community that you're going to engage. Um, Spanish language or even the indigenous in California, those are things to, to be considerate of. Um, the other is really to recognize the type of motivations that they have. Um, I think that you might find a community who really has bigger fish to fry than to make a video. Um, but if that is the case, for example, the day laborers probably initially will uh, see the project to make videos as something mundane and irrelevant to, to their everyday needs. But I think if you go into that space, what becomes really critical is to build that relationship. Just showing up makes a difference. Even if the first few times you don't talk to anybody, showing up, eventually they'll start asking you questions. But after that relationship is built, it'll also help you recognize what is really, really valuable, and that can inform the project. So for the day laborers, that eventually became, they need jobs. Maybe we can use this media stuff and these videos to get them more jobs. Um, and so I think for people entering these communities, you have to really fight the urge as an ethnographer, as an anthropologist, to not already know what the solution is um, and to give them as much space and time and support and trust that they can come up with the solution themselves and when they do that you can provide whatever training or the, the supplemental resources that they need to actually overcome and meet the goal that they're, they're trying to work towards. Would you say if you do have like an applied focus that you've had an impact? And if so, what has been the impact, at least with the work in uh, Denver since July 2017? Yeah, you know, uh, I think 
it could be both just at a personal level, just I, 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 as, a, you know, as a young person on South Side of Chicago, I would have loved to have been exposed to somebody that went to college, somebody that got a PhD. Never met any of those people until I got to college. <laughs> but I, I find that, that just a person like myself going to that community and having conversations with them in it, in it of itself makes them think about other things. And even some of them love politics, to my surprise. And we just talk about politics, right? Having that level of engagement at a personal level, I think, works both ways, right? You know, I'm learning about their perspective and they're, they're, they're learning about mine. And I'm engaging with somebody that I probably wouldn't otherwise, and it's the same for them. Now, in terms of the work itself, I think that, as you'll see in the videos, more and more, um, well, actually, when I first started, I had to create a raffle a financial incentive, right? Because otherwise they didn't necessarily see the benefits. Yeah, and it makes sense. You want to have some kind of uh, incentive, get them involved. But now, more and more, they're shooting these videos and it's there's no incentive anymore. There's actually simply a desire to have done the video and promote themselves. And then even when I've shown up, I've, I've already heard like, oh, oh, you should go talk to so-and-so. He's been showing everybody this video. So there's this sense of pride. So even if it doesn't necessarily mean that the video production, the selfie, that this, the self-documented you know, video that they're doing doesn't necessarily lead to another job, it may, it still leads to this pride. And what I found is that a lot of these day laborers take a lot of pictures and videos of their work and it serves as this archive. Um, but now that they're ch I'm encouraging them to shoot video and to talk about it, I'm finding that there is a sense of pride that they're expressing within themselves, with among their group, among their peers. Um, so I think if it doesn't necessarily lead to a job, that for me is, is benefit enough. Okay, well, thank you so much. We're going to end it here. But before we go, uh, Dr. Carlos, uh, be sure to give um, information to people if they want to learn more about your work. Yeah, yeah. So they can go to media, film, and journalism at DU and look me up. I'm Carlos Jimenez. Just put a period between my two names and uh, at DU, <laughs> and you can find me. But uh, I'm always curious to learn about co collaborations and offer any advice I can. All right, thank you, everybody. You've been tuning in to Getting High on Anthropology, and uh, see you next time. <laughs>